The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ According to Matthew. Now Jesus stood before the governor, Pilate, and Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? You say so. But when Jesus was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But Jesus gave Pilate no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. Whom do you want to release for you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. Which of the two do you want me to release for you? Barabbas. Then what should I do with Jesus? Who is called the Messiah? Let him be crucified. Why, what evil has he done? Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that the crowd, that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourself. His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered a whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him, and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, 
one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema shabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake, and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly, this man was God's son. So it seems as though there was not just one, but two processions. The day Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey or a colt, we hear that it was both depending on what version of the gospel you read. He rode in to cheering crowds, palm branches waving, and the sound of hosannas ringing in the air. It was Passover, a celebration. The city's population swelled from its usual 40,000 to over 200,000. Also entering Jerusalem from the other side of town, was Roman governor Pontius Pilate. For the people, the time had come for a Messiah to free them. For Pilate, the time had come for a show of force to keep the Jewish population from any ideas about getting out from under the thumb of Rome. Every year on this, the first day of Holy Week, we read about the fickleness of the crowds waving their palms and laying down their cloaks and shouting, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is the one. We hear how quickly they go 
from cheering, hail him, to jeering, nail him. Not the king they longed for, not the God they expected, not what hope was supposed to look like. And it isn't just the crowds. It is his his disciples and friends, witnesses of his mighty deeds of power, the ones who ate with him and traveled with him and healed with him and prayed and praised God with him who run away and leave him. For years, I could not bring myself to voice the role of the crowd, to utter the words aloud, the ones we as the community, all of us here, just said in the Passion Gospel, let him be crucified, let him be crucified. For years, I wanted to believe that were I to time travel back to those moments, I would have somehow been different than all the others, would have known better, been stronger, more courageous, enough to muster up the will to say no. For years, I couldn't or wouldn't face my own sin, couldn't believe that Jesus could have died for me, did die for me, saved me. If you couldn't love yourself before, believing this changes everything. It changes you. This is why I encourage everyone to as much as possible participate in all of Holy Week, Because the truth is, someone did say no. Peter said, Lord, this must never happen to you. And Jesus replied, do you remember what Jesus said to him? Does anybody remember? Jesus said to him, get thee behind me, Satan. Do not tempt me away from the will of God because it all had to unfold the way it did. And we are all part of this unfolding with Jesus on Maundy Thursday, sharing a table with the people he loved the most, washing feet, showing that the mark of a true leader is whether they can serve others. Jesus still loving those he knew. He knew that at best, would abandon him and at worst betray him. Jesus in the garden alone, heartbroken, struggling, take this cup from me. Not my will, your will. And on Good Friday, the world turned against him. The ones who cheered hail him now jeering, nail him. He suffers. He calls out to a God who does not seem to answer. He doubts. He feels pain and loss and grief. And in the end, he loses the life he knew. There had to be crowds shouting praises and friends who betrayed and followers who denied and women who wept and soldiers who mocked and thieves who believed. Sometimes I am asked by those who are going through difficult times if God is angry when they have doubts or when they wonder why God doesn't seem to be answering their prayers. They ask if God understands when we suffer, when we feel alone. Strange as this may seem, this is good news. Through it all, we come to God who has come to us in Jesus, who walks with us the road of our world's suffering. Because the crowds, the would-be disciples, the fickle followers, Pilate, 
the soldiers, the people in this story, they are us. We are the ones God came to save. God did not become human and dwell among us as Jesus to save us when we became perfect folks. God didn't say to us, get back to me when you've got your act together. God didn't say, get back to me when you believe every single word of the Nicene Creed that you recite every Sunday. I am holding in my hands nails. They are reminders of whatever brought us here today. Bless these nails, O Lord, to be for us reminders of those things Jesus frees us from, the things that trouble and torment us, the things that make us unfree. Give us strength to leave them at the cross on Good Friday that we may truly know Easter. Amen. In just a moment, I will invite you to come forward and to take a nail, to let it represent that thing you need or want to leave at the cross, that thing you need to give over to Jesus, that thing you've been affected by or working on your whole life but haven't been able to resolve on your own, even with your best efforts or intentions. We all know those things. Guilt, shame, fear, doubt, betrayal, disappointments, envy, the need to be perfect, the need to judge, pride, isolation, hatred, despair, resentment, a missing piece that promises to make us whole, a broken relationship in need of reconciliation, perhaps with someone in your family or your intimate circle of friends or at your job or even here amongst our own church family. I invite you to come forward, take two or three nails if need be, and come back on Good Friday and pound them into the cross that will be laying here on our broad step. Hold on to the nails during the week. Feel their weight. Keep it in your pocket. Let it poke you a time or two. It's a lot more rigid than you might think. Hold on to the nails. Live with them the entire week. And then come. I invite you to come back on Good Friday and leave it or them at the cross, the cross of Jesus Christ who died for us. Leave it all here and then wait for Easter morning. Amen. <laughs>